A Summary and Interpretation of 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Narrated and interpreted by Alexander Sandalis Rule 9 Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. This rule will unpack the various mechanisms of communication, thinking, listening, and the art of conversation. We're going to start off talking about advice. How people love to give advice. And that the whole paradigm of giving advice may be the ineffective way to approach problem solving. Psychotherapy is not advice. Advice is what you get when the person you're talking with about something horrible and complicated wishes you would just shut up and go away. Advice is what you get when the person you are talking to wants to revel in the superiority of his or her intelligence. If you weren't so stupid after all, you wouldn't have your stupid problem. Psychotherapy, on the other hand, is genuine conversation. Genuine conversation is exploration, articulation, and strategizing. And genuine conversation is what I strive to create with this. It's one of the many aims that I have with this. I want to create a genuine conversation and dialogue, open and honest, with myself. And as a result, we are creating, or I am creating that with other people like you. And that is the amazingly powerful thing about these video essays and podcasts and these platforms. And when you're involved in genuine conversation, you're listening and talking, but mostly listening. Listening is paying attention. It's amazing what people will tell you if you listen. Sometimes if you listen to people, they will even tell you what's wrong with them. Sometimes they will even tell you how they plan to fix it. Sometimes that helps you fix something wrong with you. And sometimes all you need to do is listen. And through listening, the person solves their own problem and finds their own solution without you having to say almost anything. You're like the bow in an arrow. And you're just guiding at best. And that's at best. And at least you're just there as a conduit, as a facilitator, as, a, as another set of eyes, as an honest, open set of ears. To, to hear somebody, and that is powerful. Sigmund Freud often axiomatically assumed that a distressed adult in their practice must have been subject to childhood sexual abuse. That was a big part of his practice and psychological study. He would tie in a lot of people's uh, problems in their life to some type of childhood trauma often related to in sexual in nature. He would ask, why else would they be distressed? So he the, the Freudian type of psychotherapist, a psychologist, digs and infers and intimates, intimates suggests and overreacts uh, and, and biases and tilts towards their preconceived agenda. Now, the reason I wanted to mention this and bring this up is because Peterson is bringing this up in the context of Freud and psychotherapy. However, this, is, this, is, this can be understood beyond that. This can be inferred to what we do through our own conversation. We... When we try and solve, or when we try and explain a problem in somebody, whether that be ourselves or somebody else, it doesn't matter, we often try and provide a solution or explanation in relation to our own agenda of... Uh, Freud, his was sexual abuse. Yours could be childhood trauma. Yours could be nutrition explaining why someone is suffering. Yours could be physical activity. Yours could be uh, their habits and the psychological day-to-day, -day, or it could be all of the above. Uh, everybody has this agenda of how they like to explain suffering in the world and people's distress and people's problems. We need to be, this highlights how we need to be aware of how our own biases, agendas, and overreactions can often downplay the importance of some events and exaggerate the importance of others so we can get a false improper grade understanding of where the real solution lies or of at least what the actual problem is and the problem about the Freudian approach is that you end up convincing your clients that you, they were sexually abused even though they maybe wouldn't or haven't been and all this has done is to find a convenient explanation uh, to a 
probable cause and problem. But the good news is, at least the therapist theory remains intact, at least your theory remains intact. You've found an explanation that suits your agenda and your idea and bias. And that's good for you and the therapist, but there's no shortage of collateral damage as a result of that. You need to, we need to be very careful about intimating certain suggestions uh, to, or intimating causality and solutions to people's problems when we don't, when we're not aware of our own bias and agenda. Let's now shift to discuss thinking, the idea of thinking, how people think they think, but it's not true. When we think, it's mostly, if you unpack it, it's mostly self-criticism that passes for thinking. This is something that I really need to think about to understand because am I going to cloud myself with self-criticism by trying to analyze the statement? Is this true? Do we really... I think it's not just self-criticism that we cloud our own thinking with or we trick ourselves into thinking we're thinking. It's, it's judgment of ourselves. It's judgment of others. It's a lot of egomaniacal, egotistical, mental masturbation, right? You know, true thinking is rare, Peterson says, just like true listening is rare. Thinking is, thinking is listening to yourself. It's difficult. To think you have to be at least two people at the same time, and this is challenging. You have to let these two people inside your head disagree and agree. You have to have this internal uh, dialogue between chaos and order, between two of these different opposing views of the world. Think of these viewpoints as different avatars. And true thinking is complex and demanding. It requires you to be an articulate speaker and a careful, judicious listener at the same time. It involves conflict, so you have to tolerate conflict. And to conflict is, is uncomfortable. People don't like to, to engage in conflict. Some people love it for their own reasons. Some people thrive off it. I, 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 I think that, that energy of, of conflict, I thrive off in a lot of ways. But conflict, internally at least, and ex externally with other people, it involves a negotiation compromise. So you have to learn to give and take and modify your premises and adjust your thoughts, even your perceptions of the world. This is what Peterson purports to be true effective thinking. What really thinking is, instead of what we think thinking is. Thinking is emotionally painful as well as physiologically demanding, more so than anything else, except not thinking. But you have to be very articulate and sophisticated to have all of this occur inside your own head. But you, you practice, right? You practice sitting with yourself. You, you, this, what we're doing here, what I'm doing here, I'm practicing thinking, having a dialogue with myself, with, with uh, a pretend audience who I'm speaking to. I'm speaking to myself, but I'm, there's also this audience of unlimited people that I'm speaking to right now. And so we're, we're figuring it out and you, we can all practice this in our own ways. I think there's utility in talking to yourself. You know, in, <laughs> we associate talk, we have traditionally associated talking to oneself as, as crazy and, and psychopathic and, you know, people with um, schizophrenia or other mental disorders will, will, will talk to themselves in a more of a maniacal type of way. But I think talking to ourselves and having this dialogue, especially out loud, is valuable and and, and very, very, uh, it has a lot of utility, especially when you look in the mirror and you talk to yourself and you're like, oh, okay, that's me. I'm looking at me and I'm having a dialogue with me and I'm learning how to think and engage with myself and then I can learn to think and engage with the outside world. And Peterson's next sentence is, what do you do then if you aren't very good at thinking, at being two people at one time? Peterson says, that's easy, you talk. There you go. Isn't that amazing? Literally said what I just said. You, you need someone to listen. A listening person is your collaborator and your opponent. And this could be a physical person or it could be yourself. A listening person tests your talking and your thinking without having to say anything. A listening person is a representative of common humanity. That's the power of listening. You see, when you listen to somebody, you don't... You're not just giving them the opportunity to let them be heard. You're giving them the opportunity to let them flesh out their ideas to let them understand what they're really thinking, whether what they're really thinking is actually what they thought they were thinking. And I'm, when I say that, I'm not trying to be fancy or, 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 or fluffy with my words. I'm, we're really, that's what we're really trying to do. 
And here is a perfect example of Pearson exemplifying the power of listening and how you don't need to say anything sometimes. A client of mine might say, I hate my wife. And once it's out there, it's hanging in there, it's emerged from the underworld, it's, it's manifested itself and this has now become real. And the speaker may startle himself when he says it. And he sees the same thing reflected in my eyes. He notes that and continues on the road to sanity. Hold on, he says, back up, that's too harsh. Sometimes I, sometimes I hate my wife. I hurt her when she won't tell me what she wants. Okay, good, we've identified it. Let's go more. My mum did that to me all the time too. It drove my dad crazy. It drove us all crazy to tell you the truth. It even drove mum crazy. She was a nice person, but she was very resentful. Well, at least my wife isn't as bad as my mother. Not at all. Wait, I guess my wife is actually pretty good at telling me what she wants. But I get really bothered when she doesn't, because mum tortured us half to death being a martyr. That really affected me. Maybe I overreact overreacted now when it happens even a bit. Hey, I'm acting just like dad did when mum upset him. That isn't me. That doesn't have anything to do with my wife. I better let her know. You can observe this transformation of self and transformation and, and realization just by listening. Peterson says, I observe from all this that my client had failed previously to properly distinguish his wife from his mother. And I see that he was possessed unconsciously by the spirit of his father. He sees all of that too now. Now he's a bit more differentiated, a bit less an uncarved block, a bit less hidden in the fog. He sewed up a small tear in the fabric of his own culture and his own being. He says, that's a good session, Dr. Peterson. I nod. You can be pretty smart if you shut up. Maybe we should all just shut the hell up sometimes, right? Maybe, maybe we need to do that more often. And I, I am plagued. I have been plagued with this habit of always wanting to be the fixer, of always trying to provide the solution, of always trying to come back with something, always having a response. I need to learn to shut the hell up sometimes. I love to talk. I love to negotiate and have dialogue and conversation. You know, I want to create a podcast where I can have conversations with people. That's it. Just my favorite people who I enjoy having conversations with. And I hope to do this one day when I can set up the space to. But for now, oh, perfect time. This is, just to let you guys know, this is available on, a, on my podcast as well. You can go on Spotify, Stitcher, um, Apple. It's all there if you want to listen to this on audio instead. If it's easier. I digress. Carl Rogers, one of the 20th century's greatest psychotherapists, knew something about listening. The great majority of us cannot listen. We find ourselves compelled to evaluate because listening is too dangerous. The first requirement is courage, and we do not always have it. He knew that listening could transform people. Some of you may be feeling that you listen well to people. The chances are very great indeed that your listening has not been the type that we are about to describe. Rogers insisted that his readers conduct a short experiment when they found themselves next in a dispute. Stop the discussion for a moment. Institute this rule. Each person can speak up for himself only after he has first restated the ideas and feelings of the previous speaker accurately and to that speaker's satisfaction. Peterson has found this technique very useful in his private life and practice. And this is something I've been incorporating through my learnings of how to win friends and influence people, which I've summarized as well. A tremendous, um, classic, you know, 80, 90 year old book uh, that you can find here as well. But this is what they talk about. It's like, hold on, we stop the conversation and, and, and pause. So what you're saying is this, you're saying this, and then you restate the person's ideas and you summarize them in a, in a short form. And then you get them to acknowledge, is that, is that accurate? Is that about right? Do I, have, do I understand you correctly? And then, now we have built a bridge of understanding, of common ground. Because oftentimes, we think we understand the person, and they think that we're understanding them, but often there's a, miscommuni there's, there's a disconnect because between, between uh, communication and interpretation. There are several primary advantages to this process of summary. The first advantage is that I genuinely come to understand what the person is saying. Of this, Rogers notes sounds simple, doesn't it? But if you try it, you will discover it is one of the most difficult things you have ever tried to do. If you really understand a person in this way, if you are willing to enter his private world and see the way, uh, the way life appears to him, 
you run the risk of being changed yourself and that's scary. That's dangerous. People... That's... That's where conflict occurs internally. The risk of being changed is one of the most frightening prospects most of us can face. But I think if we welcome this, if we welcome that we if we can be like water, that we are formless, that we are we assume no form, that we have that we can adapt and mold our ideas and that it's okay to disagree and that it's okay to it's also okay to find common ground and it's preferred. And that should be the first thing we do, okay? We disagree about some things, but let's find some common ground and let's build on that. We're at odds with one another and we don't need to be at, at our throats. We're all human beings. And if we all can find some common ground to build a, a stable relationship on, then we can be a bit more productive in this world. I really believe that. The second advantage to this active summary is that it aids the person in consolidation and utility of memory. By consolidating stories and ideas, we can mitigate all the meanderings and the emotional laden accounts and all the biases and agendas into just one couple strict direct sentences. And so now you've formed a different me memory in many ways, hopefully a better memory that's less bogged down in minutia. And Peterson says in this rule here that remember that, that memory, we don't have memory so we can remember the past. We, we have memory so that we can not repeat the mistakes of the past. It, it, the utility of memory historically seems to be to not repeat the same mistakes, to know that the fire is hot, to know that the lion can kill you. The third advantage to employing the Rogerian method is the difficulty it poses to the careless construction of straw man arguments. So when someone opposes you, it's very tempting to oversimplify parody, hyperbole, distort his or her perception, or position rather. And th but this is counterproductive game that we all play, designed to both harm the, the, the dissenter and to unjustly raise your personal status, make yourself feel better, put yourself on a higher pedestal. By contrast, if you are called upon to summarize someone's position so that the speaking person agrees with that summary, you may have to state the argument even more clearly and succinctly than the speaker has even yet managed. And understanding your opposing, the opposing person's point of view is the only way we can understand truth. The only way that we can thoroughly understand even our own ideas. We need to be able to argue both sides. And some would say even more so the opposing side. It's very convenient to, to argue why animals shouldn't be killed. It's very easy to argue for the ethical reasons of veganism. But can you, as a vegan, argue the opposite? Can you argue and see the point of view of a carnivore? of someone who eats meat and hunts. And the hunter, can you understand and empathize and argue for the vegan side? The, 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 for the person who doesn't want to harm any animals? And I'm not going to do that here because that's not what this is about here. We're not trying to unpack specific ideologies and, and almost, fuck it, almost religions that they're becoming. I'm not trying to unpack that here. I'm trying to build, we're trying to build a framework that the rest can be built upon. If you first give the devil his due, looking at his arguments from his perspective, you can find value in them and learn something in the process, or two, hone your positions against them, if you still believe they are wrong, and strengthen your arguments further against challenge. And this will make you much stronger and smarter, more intelligent. Then you will no longer have to misrepresent your opponent's position, and you will be at much better odds to withstand your own doubts. Imagine that someone holds a stack of $100 bills, some of which are counterfeit. All the bills might have to be spread on a table so that each can be seen and any differences noted before the genuine can be distinguished from the false. This is the sort of methodical approach you have to take when really listening to someone trying to solve a problem or communicate something important. If upon learning that some of the bills are counterfeit, you too causally dismiss all of them, as you would if you were in a hurry or otherwise unwilling to put in the effort to listen. The person will never learn to separate the wheat from the chaff. 
I think it's so helpful to think of ideas and thoughts and arguments as a set of $100 bills. Some of them, some of the nuances of those ideas are going to be real. Count, they're going to be gold. They're going to be quality. They're going to be pristine. But some are going to be false. Some are going to be counterfeit. Some need to be remodeled and remade. And if you listen instead without premature judgment, people will generally tell you everything they are thinking. And with very little deceit, people will tell you that most amazing, absurd, interesting things. Very few of your conversations will be boring. You can in fact tell whether or not you're actually listening in this manner. If the conversation is prob- is boring, you probably aren't listening very well. And I'm going to add to that. You probably, you're probably the boring person because you're probably not asking questions because you're probably not curious. And that's a whole different thing. Why aren't you curious? Why don't you want to ask questions? What type of questions do you really want to know? What do you want to know? Do you want to know anything? Why don't you want to know anything? Of course you want to know something. What is it? What do you want to know? Ask yourself, then ask the questions. Things won't become boring anymore. No matter who you talk to, whether it's a jet skier or a, or a snowboarder or a mathematician or a chess player or a midwife or a nerd, whatever. There should be there's this interesting dialogue to be had with everybody. If you just listen, ask, and are curious. Now here's how dialogue, conversation, thinking, and arguments can relate to dominance and hierarchies and power. There is the conversation, for example, where one participant is speaking merely to establish or confirm his place in the dominance hierarchy. One person begins by telling a story about something interesting uh, that occurred, recent or past, that involves something good, bad or surprising enough to make the listening worthwhile. The other person now concerned with his or her potentially substandard status as less as a less in- interesting individual immediately thinks of something better, worse, or more surprising to relate to. This isn't one of those situations where two conversational participants are genuinely playing off each other, riffing on the same things for mutual enjoyment of both. There is a there, here instead. There is a jockeying for position, pure and simple, and you can tell when one of these conversations are occurring. They are they are accompanied by a feeling of embarrassment among among the speakers alike, and all who know that something false and exaggerated has just been said. These conversations are so ugly, disgusting, and just. They just don't feel right. I've seen it happen. I've done it myself. We've all done it, right? You have a conversation with somebody. And you're like, oh, man, how was your weekend, right? I'm going to do it real simple. How's your weekend? Man, it was great. I did this. I did that. Boom, boom, boom. Um, now you're going to try and one-up them. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, oh, yeah, man. You don't even, they don't even ask you how your weekend was. And you're into telling them about the story they just told you. But your story is apparently 10 times better. Your story, you, you only, not only did you climb the mountain, you also you also took the zip line down. Yeah. And you did it in half the time they did it. Why do we got to try and one-up each other? There's always going to be someone with a bigger dick. There's always going to be someone with bigger tits. A bigger ass. What's the point? There's always going to be someone with a cooler story, with more money and more resources. How about you just listen and shut the hell up? And stop trying to big up yourself and one up yourself. And these conversations, no one's listening to each other. It's just a back and forth. Like, I did this, I did this. You did this, I did this, I did this, I did. It's like there's no dialogue happening. It's just a back and forth. No one's acknowledging what's being said. I've seen these conversations and I'm like thinking in my head, what the hell is going on? Are they not realizing what's happening right now? Subconsciously, they they probably are. But they're so entwined in their superficial trying to impress each other. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, holy hell. Like, is that what's really happening right now? There's no conversation being had. It's a joke. Instead, each is using the time occupied by the current speaker to conjure up what he or she will say next. So you, while while the person speaking, you're thinking of what you're trying to say next, so you can, all right, what am I going to say next? What do I need to say next? Like the silence, like, like the idea of silence in a conversation is poisonous, or the idea that a person can have a better weekend than you is, is, is insane, right? It's okay. We can do different things, guys. 
It's like, with, okay, now we're trying to use this time to conjure up what he, what he or she was saying next, which will often be something off topic because the person is actually waiting to speak and has not been listening. And this can bring the whole conversation to a shuddering halt. And then there is another type of conversation where one participant is trying to attain victory from his or point of view. This is more of the, uh, the power hungry, uh, the uncontrolled, egotistical individual who wants to impress his, the people s surrounding him. During this conversation, which often tends towards the ide ideological, the speaker endeavors to, one, denigrate or ridicule the viewpoint of anyone else holding the contrary position, or two, use selective evidence while doing so, and three, imp uh, impress the listeners, many of whom are already occupying the same ideological space, so confirmation bias. He has a herd of sheep following him, va validating his assertions. So the goal here is to gain support for the comprehensive, unitary, oversimplified worldview that he or she holds. This is so dangerous. This is just, me this is mental masturbation. This is just, we're all just trying to confirm, this is a circle jerk. We're all just trying to confirm, confirm our own pre-existing agendas and biases. No one's going to disagree with me. And whoever disagrees with me, I'm going to denigrate, insult you, and uh, admonish your, your opinion because you're, because of some other reason that I've found to, to do so that has nothing actually to do with the idea we're discussing. Um, well, because I can't, I can't admit I'm wrong. That's important. No, that's that's that would hurt my ego and my self identity because we wrap our ideas up in our identity. That would restructure my identity. I would have to restructure my identity, and that I can't do. That's too painful. I can't even acknowledge that. And so that's where these types. This is this is when this type of these type of conversations occur. And this type of person believes that. Uh, this type of person who is speaking in this manner believes that winning the argument makes him right, and that doing so necessarily validates the assumption structure of the dominant hierarchy he most identifies with. Almost all discussions involving politics or, eco or economics unfold in this manner, with each participant attempting to justify fixed a priori positions instead of trying to learn something or to adopt a different frame. It is for this reason that conservatives and liberals alike believe their positions to be self-evident, particularly as they become more extreme. These conversations are very different from the listening type. When your genuine listening conversation is taking place, one person at a time has the floor and everyone is listening. This is what's so great about having, like, what I admire so much about uh, the Joe Rogan Experience podcast is that we're able, he's able to bridge the gap and have these open, honest conversations. The cameras are just there documenting. They're just there. The audio equipment is just recording. They're looking at each other's eyes across each other, and we're having an honest, open conversation through intellectual curiosity. And, and I cannot wait to have that myself. And a part of me thinks, well, oh, everyone's got a podcast now. But a part of me thinks, who cares? Everyone doesn't have your you. No one's you. No one's going to, you're not going to have the conversations you're going to have. And it's not about them. It's about, well, there's unlimited people who, who can, ears who uh, can, can listen. You know, there's so much opportunity for people. There's no scarcity, right? We all, there's so much room for, for everyone can win if you want to economically win in this space. But beyond that, it's like, hold on. This is just about me wanting to have a conversation. It's just about, let's just have a conversation. And let's just document it because I don't want to forget it. And because uh, other people can benefit from it. Let's uplift ourselves and our communities. I cannot wait. And, um, you know, the, 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 the more this grows, the closer that will happen. Because there's economics tied up into, into this, whatever this is, growing. And that's going to help create what I envision to create one day. So, we'll see. We'll see. I can't wait for it. As we round out this rule, let's discuss one problem of communication often men are stereotyped to having, and that is wanting to fix things. And this is something I've identified with heavily and something I've previously talked about in other videos and other rules. Men are often the fixers. We want to fix things too early in the discussion. And this frustrates us because men like to solve problems and do so efficiently, and are often called upon by women to do so for precisely that purpose. But if we could realize and then remember that before a problem can be solved, it must be formulated precisely. And this is some of our biggest problems. We jump in too soon before the problem has even been precisely accurately formed. And women are often intent on formulating the problem when they are discussing something and they need to be listened to, even questioned to help ensure clarity in this formation. We jump in too quick. And it's not just guys. 
Everybody does this sometimes. We jump in too quick. Uh, I feel like my remedy for this has been, I will first, I've understood through the fire, through having tough conversations with important women in my life that, you know, I've made, they've told me. They've told me through their, their emotion that they don't need me. And this is really a message to pretty much all men. They don't always need us to fix their problems. They don't need a solution or a response or an ideal scenario or a back and forth to everything that they say. We can do that easily because we, we especially among this area right here when we're talking about these ideas of psychology and behavior, it's like, you know, there's always a better way to do it. There's always a better way to think and to problem solve. There's always more room to grow. They don't always need to hear that. People don't always need to hear that. And one way I've trying to I've maneuvered around this is just by asking, hey, before you go on, do you just want me to listen here? Do you just want someone to, to hear you and to listen? Or do you actually want me to ask, ask you some questions and question you and challenge you and create some some dialogue from this, or are you just trying to vent? Are you just trying to let some energy out of you right now? Because often we don't we don't often ask this question. And we, if we can ask this question at, at at the beginning of the dialogue of the conversation, then everything else from there will go much more smoothly, and, and both parties will be able to build common ground. You you'll be able to listen and play your role as the listener, and they'll be able to play their role as the thinker and doing what they did before and helping formulate and articulate their ideas because they don't even know the, they don't even know necessarily what their problem is. And you think you have a solution? They don't even know what their problem is. You're trying to provide a solution to a problem that they don't even know exists, that they haven't even formulated yet. No wonder they get frustrated. No wonder people, no wonder we get uh, agitated and emotional when, when, when guys try and fix a lot of women's issues like that. The final type of conversation is a form of mutual exploration. So beautifully put. We're exploring ideas here. I'm not trying to say this is how you should live your life. I don't care. But I do care. Because I care about the common humanity of all of us. But it's this duality of like, care and don't care. I care what you think, I don't care what you think. I care if you change, I don't care if you change. We're trying to explore these ideas and I hope you take something out of it. Just the same way I hope I can take something out of it. And this requires true reciprocity on the part of those listening and speaking. It allows all participants to express and organize their thoughts. A conversation of mutual exploration has a topic generally complex, a genuine interest to the participants. Everyone participating is trying to solve a problem instead of insisting on the priori validity of their own positions instead of putting their own agendas on you in the conversation. So all are acting on the premise that they have something to learn. They're open. Hold on, I might be wrong. I'm probably wrong. I'm wrong often. I might be wrong here. Maybe you can teach me something. Even scientific literature that we're so confident about through peer-reviewed, longitudinal studies. Hey, guess what? Sometimes we're wrong here too. And even though I'm super confident in scientific literature, I understand that that too can change. And this kind of conversation constitutes active philosophy. The highest form of thought and the best preparation for proper living. These people involved in such conversation must be discussing ideas they generally use to structure their uh, perceptions and guide their actions and words. They must be existentially involved with their philosophy. That is, they must be living it, not merely believing or understanding it. And that's the thing, we can read these books. I can do all this, right? Am I living it? Watch my behavior. Don't just watch my words, watch what I do. Am I living it? How am I communicating with the people? I'm going to contradict myself. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to mess up. And so so will you. But are you, are you trying to live to the highest truth and the highest order and the highest good? 
through the value system that you're, you think is, is right for you. The conversation of mutual exploration by contrast requires people who have decided that the unknown makes a better friend than the known. It's the idea that knowing, knowing you know nothing is the meaning of true knowledge. Seneca. It's befriending that you know nothing. You already know what you know after all. And unless your life is perfect, what you know is not enough. And no one's life is perfect, so you don't know enough. You remain threatened by disease, self-deception, unhappiness, malevolence, betrayal, corruption, pain, limitation. You are subject to all these things in the final abyss because you are just too ignorant to protect yourself. If you just knew enough, you could be healthier and more honest. You would suffer less. And so that's the path we're on now. <laughs> to know a bit more, to act a bit more, to do a bit more, to be a bit smarter. And you could recognize, resist, and even triumph over malevolence and evil. You would neither betray a friend nor deal falsely and deceitfully in business, politics, or love. However, your current knowledge has neither made you perfect nor kept you safe. For some of you. So it is insufficient by definition, radically, fatally insufficient. You must accept this before you can converse philosophically instead of convincing, oppressing, dominating, or even amusing. And so many people aren't doing this, and it saddens me. But it's the hardest thing. Look at this. You know how much you have to care about being a better person, about about developing your, your psychological framework? You know how many people don't care? Who are, who are sleeping through this? Who are not awake, if you want to use that term? There's unlimited people who are. Well, actually, no, there's not. But there's a lot. And you must accept this before you can tolerate a conversation with the world that eternally mediates between order and chaos is operating, psychologically speaking. You must mediate too, instead of strategizing towards victory. If you fail or refuse to do so, then you are merely automatically repeating what you already believe, seeking its validation, insisting on its rightness, confirmation bias, once again. If you are mediating as you converse, then you listen to other, the other person, and you say the new and original things that can rise from deep within their own accord. It's as if you're listening to yourself during a conversation, just as you are listening to the other person. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm listening to myself. I'm reading Peterson's words, but I'm also talking to myself because I'm thinking about his words and how they interact with my ideas and my values. Do they work? Are they effective? Is there something that we can flesh out more? A conversation such as this is one where it is the desire for truth itself on the part of both participants that is truly listening and speaking. That's why these conversations are engaging, vital, interesting, and meaningful. Because there's a desire for truth, there's an open understanding, there's, a, there's, there's less barriers of conversation, there's, there's less filter, there's less colored lens. That sense of meaning is a signal from the deep ancient parts of your being. You're where you should be, with one foot in one, one and the other tentatively extended into chaos and the unknown. You're immersed in the, in, the, in, the Tao, in the Tao, following the great way of life. There, you're stable enough to be secure, but flexible enough to transform. Stable enough to be secure, but flexible enough to transform. So it's not being so watery that you, you have no stakes in the ground. That's not what we're talking about. You need your stakes in the ground to be secure. You need to have a foundation of ideas. You need to be sure about something. You need to be have axioms that ground you, but you need to be flexible enough to transform, mold, and, and refine them in every field. There you're allowing new information to inform you, to permeate your stability, to repair and improve its structure and expand its domains. Exactly what I just said. A conversation like that places you in the same place that listening to great music places you. And for much the same reason, a conversation like that puts you in the realm where souls connect and that's a real place. It leaves you thinking, that was really worthwhile. We really got to know each other. We really built something. We really connected. The masks came off and the searches were revealed. We are able to breathe and live and communicate openly and honestly and it's beautiful when you can do that and you know when you're doing it because it's like time is no, time is not a construct you forget about it so listen to yourself and to those with whom you are speaking your wisdom then consists not of the knowledge you already have but the but the continual search for knowledge which is the highest form of wisdom it's this continual hunger for curiosity and learning more and this is what i love so much about life and what i what i what i relish 
and what part of me wishes I could live for hundreds of years, it's this, this continual search for knowledge and then act. And then it's like build, let's break down the body so we can build it up and the mind too. And this is the highest search of wisdom. And it excites me to no end. To, to, the, to the unlimited potential that we have and I have. And it's for this reason that the priestess of the Delphic Oracle in, the, in ancient Greece spoke most highly of Socrates, who always sought the truth. She described him as the wisest living man because he knew that what he knew was nothing. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't.